Curators at the Mary Rose Museum have attracted criticism this week after a blog post appeared on the museum's website entitled Queering the Mary Rose's Collection. A selection of items which were found on the famous Tudor warship have been given speculative LGBT reimaginings, which has led to much mockery. A collection of 82 knit combs recovered from the seabed have even been deemed significant because hairstyling is associated with gender. So, here to discuss with this... Uh, Get this right, with puffs. Uh, Get this absolutely David right. David Starkey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> As plain spoken as ever, I think two gay men are allowed to use that term. We are indeed. Uh, so, David, um, you were a. Tra but, 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 and let's go back again. Yes. The, what this post did was complete, written by a woman, of course, to, <laughs> called Hannah, to parody gay men. Fun, do you know what it consisted of? Saying, gay men spend all their time looking at a mirror, dear, and doing their hair. And this is the great problem with this, uh, these alleged liberationist movements. And again, it's with trans. Why do all trans men look like a parody of a woman? It's it, a very it, good it, question. It is, a, it is an entirely parodistic notion. Well, I mean, I mean, certainly some of the prominent activists certainly seem that way. There are, there are some trans people who completely want to live their lives and pass as the other sex and just be left alone. And then you've got the militant activists who always seem to adopt extreme grotesque stereotypes for some reason, which, which is... I don't think it's an accident. I think, that, I think, again, it's one of the things that makes it so ultra, I mean, ultimately damaging. Um, it's a parody. It's also something going on in people's heads. The whole of the woke movement is a triumph of language over reality. I always say trans is very closely related to transubstantiation. Mm. What happens in the high Catholic church, the notion that a priest pronounces a magic word, hoc est corpus, and you know what? Suddenly the bread becomes flesh and the wine becomes blood. It's mystical, it's nonsense. Sublime mysticism and nonsense. So how does a museum do this? Well, I was going to ask you about that because, I mean, how, the, the Mary Rose, it's a, such a wonderful thing to go to see. And then you've got this blog sort of, which actually does not uh, elucidate anything about no, the history. On the contrary, what it does, it's a personal riff. Hannah is doing a personal riff. She is saying, these objects speak to me now in the 21st century. Yes. Of course, this is... And the tragic thing is, you know, she's actually doing... I mean, I've got a lot of skin in this game. I used to be the historian trustee of the Mary Rose. The course that she's doing at Royal Holloway, public history, that's history in the marketplace, not history in the, in, in the academic world. It's founded by one of my former students, by Anna Whitelock, for whom I've got great affection. So there's a terrible sense of good things having gone wrong. Yes. I adore the Mary Rose. It is... If that's, if that's too gay. I mean, it, is, <laughs> it, is, it is the English tomb of Tutankhamun. It's yes. not just a load of old wood. It is the most astonishing collection of Tudor objects, and real things. But what we need to be doing is explaining what is really there. See, if you want to talk about real sex, everybody, we're a little <laughs> bit... You know, I'm a great believer in real sex as opposed to sex in flesh rather than sex on the brain. If we're going to do that, the Mary Rose has got the most extraordinary witness to the fact that there were 400 men who were all cooped up together, and the moment they got on shore, they went whippy. And I'm afraid there were consequences, because the 16th century is the beginning of venereal disease. And one of the most extraordinary objects, which this woman should have been talking about, on the Mary Rose, and can we see it now, the famous syringe. Because extraordinary things survive on the Mary Rose. The complete instrument chest of a barber surgeon. And, uh, the, in other words, the medic on the Mary Rose. We've even got his skull cap, his velvet skull cap, all there and all the equipment, the same way the master carpenter, but, and many of the tools are the same, of course. The saws and the drills are pretty much interchangeable between the, they, between the surgeon. Where does and, the syringe and, go? Le, the, let the me. One that we well, saw. No, no, no. no. Well, I'm just building. Come on. Yeah. I'm building up to this gently. Look time, at time is it's limited, got, though. It's got, it's got this perfect beaked end, and we found a little drop of mercury inside it, and it fits into the urethra of the penis. <laughs> Every man who goes by... <laughs> um, and you see, she wanted to talk about sex. She could have then really sort of found out from that mercury, yeah. yes. venereal disease. She wanted to talk about Henry VIII 
and legislation under Henry VIII. The evidence of the use of mercury in the Tudor navy, in other words, bluntly for the lowest of the low, it shows that Henry VIII did not have venereal disease because we've actually got his complete, not his medical record, but the re his pharmaceutical record, the record of all the drugs administered to him, and he wasn't given mercury. Yes. Ergo, he doesn't have venereal disease. It's an osteomyelitic ulcer. See, that's what yeah. you do. Unlike it's the poor sailors on the Merry Rivers. Unlike the poor who sailors. Who were riddled. Who were riddled absolutely with riddled. Uh, but at least, at least they'd had a bit of fun. So. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but you're right, there's so much exciting and fascinating aspects about the artefacts that were found on the Merry Rose. So to, uh, to sort of impose these kind of very ephemeral, voguish ideas, it's, it's boring, actually. It's boring. It's patronising. Again, you know, one of the things that might be good about woke, it emphasises we should treat different cultures according to their own values. Right. Then we need to, the past is the most different culture of all. And instead, we treat the past simply as an opportunity to show virtue or to show we are better than they are. And, and it is the silliest idea of the world to apologise for something in which everybody doing it, both the victim and the victor, is dead. What can possibly be done? Who can possibly gain? Absolutely. David Starkey, really, I wish we had more time, but thanks so much for joining me today. A pleasure.